Good afternoon. I just heard the campus bells ringing, so I can say good afternoon. I'm David Hahn, the Craig Berg Dean of the College of Engineering, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our third and our final webinar of the Spring 2023 Alumni Faculty Lecture Series. Our goal does remain the same, and that is to share discussions on important topics and have a conversation with our alumni and friends, many of you who generously support this college and have truly helped to make this happen. Thank you. I often talk about the most significant challenges that face society, and that's food and water and energy and healthcare and security. And we're going to continue that theme today, touching on water and security with respect to security and sustainability of our supply chain and incorporation of sustainable feedstocks. Today, our conversation will dive into a subject that can have global implications and also strong implications on the Arizona state economy, and that is creating a sustainable bioeconomy for arid regions. So it's my pleasure today to be joined by our faculty member and my colleague, Kim Ogden, and by UA alumnus, David Derrick. Let me say a few words of introduction for both of our panelists. Um, Dr. Kim Ogden is professor and department chair of chemical and environmental engineering here in the College of Engineering. She's a pioneer in the design of bioreactors for producing renewable energy from algae and has led research projects for large scale, and scale is important in this, these discussions, development of biofuels that are cleaner than fossil fuels and high value bioproducts for industry such as rubber and resins. Kim earned her BS in degree in, at UPenn and her MS and PhDs at the University of Colorado, all in chemical engineering. Welcome, Kim. I'd also like to introduce our second panelist, David Derrick, Dr. Derek is the manager and plant breeder geneticist for Bridgestone's agro operations at the Waiuli Research Farm in Elroy, Arizona. David strives to develop a new domestic and sustainable source of natural rubber products. He formerly served as the research leader and location coordinator at the USDA ARS National Center for Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado. Prior to that, he was a researcher at the USDA in Maricopa. He is an alumnus of the University of Arizona, earning his PhD in plant science department. Welcome, David. So as we usually do to kind of frame this discussion, I'm going to turn this over to Kim and David to share some slides, kind of talk through some background material that will lead into our normal panel discussion. So David and Kim, I'm turning it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, David. Um, Perfect. We see everything nicely, Kim. Perfect. So today what we're going to talk about is a desert crop called Waiuli. And this is a crop that in the stems has natural rubber. And this natural rubber can be used to make things such as tires. First, we're going to talk a little bit about where we've been, both as a consortium with the University of Arizona and other partners, and then Dave's going to tell a little bit about the big picture for Bridgestone. And then we'll talk a little, then I'll talk a little bit about what's our next steps and where are we going next. So we started um, at the, with the University of Arizona. One of the people in plant scientists has been working on Waiuli for millions, you know, a lot of years. <laughs> um, and uh, that was uh, Dave's advisor in plant sciences. And then uh, we wrote a grant and we received funding from the NEFA. Um, CAP program, where we have a consortium that is U of A is the lead with New Mexico State, Colorado State, USDA research labs, and Bridgestone and Colorado School of Mines and our extension offices to look at Waiuli. Yeah. So the overview for what we've worked on is for Waiuli, we were looking at all aspects of Waiuli, everything from how you grow it in the ground to how you make co-products and things, and then a lot of techno-economic and life cycle assessment. So our systems performance sustainability is where we do uh, techno-economic modeling. We've done some transportation modeling. We've done a lot of LCA work. And then as we get more and more data from the field and from the laboratory, then we continuously update those models um, to, and sometimes the models then help inform some of the research that we're gonna do. In the field, we looked at a lot of like what cultivars to plant, what temperatures can things work at, 
Um, and very importantly, how little irrigation can we get away with um, since water is such a um, big issue here in Southern Arizona. And then we looked at co-products. So everybody knows that like with petroleum, they use like every molecule of carbon possible to make co-products. And so for the Waiuli plant, we need to do the same thing to have a viable bioeconomy. We, we have the rubber, but we have to be able to make valuable co-products. So that was part of the research. And then for these things, there's a huge amount of extension education and outreach. So this was a $15 million grant that we're in the sixth year of, and it, we're in a no-cost extension. And $5 million of that had to go to extension education and outreach because that's what USD has us do. So let me just briefly talk a little bit about natural versus synthetic rubber to give you a little bit of background. Um, synthetic rubber comes from petroleum. It's a petroleum byproduct. Since it's a chemical reaction that you take some monomers and can turn it into rubber, you do have a little bit more flexibility on the properties that you can make. Um, and you know a lot of different types of synthetic rubber you might be familiar with, think anything from like balloons to wetsuits to rubber bands. Whereas natural rubber traditionally has come from the Havea tree and this um, has much higher tensile strength and natural elasticity. And it's primarily used for automotive and aerospace. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and he's gonna talk a little bit more about Waiuli and Bridgestone. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, for um, Kim already pointed out that all of our rubber now comes from the Avea brasiliensis tree that's all grown in a certain part of the world, Southeast Asia. And actually it's a clone. And so the way it works is that we have all these forests that have been replaced with a single clonal tree. And so that's one of the risks that we see with having you know, one single biological source and all geographically located in, in one part of the world. And so, you know, it just puts all these um, barriers up of like rising labor costs. So it's important to recognize that agriculture in other parts of the world isn't the same as it is in the US where everything is mechanized. So one guy has to walk out and visit the same tree at least five days out of the week. So very labor intensive. And as these countries advance, these costs for labor, because we're competing with other low cost crops like palm oil is becoming more expensive. And so all tire companies are seeing this risk that's, that's being posed and seeing the necessity to having a domestic source of natural rubber. So the, the pie chart that I have on the right side shows the breakdown of the feedstocks that we need for tires. So Kim mentioned, you know, was showing the difference between synthetic rubber and natural rubber. Natural rubber is a bigger feedstock than anything else that we use in tires because maybe for passenger tires, synthetic rubber is, a, is okay. But as we go to these truck tires and even like the 18 wheelers, they have to be all natural rubber. And then as we go larger to the ag tires, again, they have to be all natural rubber. Airplane tires have to be all natural rubber. Synthetic rubber can't do what natural rubber does. It doesn't have the same properties. So let's go to the next slide. So Bridgestone over the past 10 years has made a pretty large investment into this project. We spent over a hundred million dollars in putting in the processing facility that's in East Mesa. So the picture on the left shows the processing plant and the, the feed uh, facility on the right side of that plant. And then there's an aerial view showing the offices and the um, processing part of the, the plant. And then in Eloy, not Elroy, it's um, <laughs> that we have a, a three, about a 300 acre farm that's totally planted in Waiuli. So that's probably the largest 
um, farm of Waiuli there is in the world. Um, and then we contract with other growers to, to produce Waiuli too that feeds that, that processing facility. It's not commercial, but it's they're learning uh, the best way to engineer the processing plant and extract it in the most efficient way. And then I wanted to mention that the photo on the right side, back in the 1980s, the government had a project where they tried to um, start a domestic source of natural rubber. They built a processing facility on the Gila River Indian community land in Santan. Um, and it went on for a couple years, but really didn't succeed. And there was a lot of reasons for that, but it it still gave us a background of when we started our processing facility, we learned a lot of things to do and a lot of things not to do. So next slide. So a little bit about the crop. Um, it's native to Mexico. You can see the map up on the top right part of the of the slide and all the dots represent where Waiuli is native to. So this north central part of Mexico all the way up. So all through the Chihuahuan Desert up into the Big Bend area of Texas is where we get a lot of our germplasm uh, comes from. So um, it accumulates rubber in the stem portions. Um, you can see that cross section, that blue part. So if you were to cut a shrub or a stem in half, and look down on what you're um, onto the stem. It's really the bark layer where all these parenchyma cells are and the rubber accumulates inside these parenchyma cells and um, form these rubber particles. And so rubber is about, makes up about four to 5% total of, of the plant. And then resins are produced about seven to 9% depending on, on the variety. Um, so this is a perennial shrub, takes about two years to get to maturity. So we, we said that these two products and with the rubber, you can extract it as a solid rubber to make tires. That's the largest market for natural rubber. The US consumes about 1.8 billion pounds every year. So by far the largest market, but we can also make it into latex for medical products. And there's 40,000 different products besides tires that have higher value than what, what tires have uh, for use in medical devices, gloves. Um, and the, this latex is all hypoallergenic. So different than Havea rubber in that, in that respect. A lot of people are allergic to Havea rubber, but this Waiuli rubber is hypoallergenic. Now with these resins, you can make all sorts of products. It's just this soup of terpenes that can be fractioned out. The different fractions of terpenes can be fractionated, uh, making products like adhesives, um, anti-termitic properties, anti, um, well, it has a, it could be used as a mosquito repellent. That's some of the work that SBAR is doing. And then what's left over, we call the bagasse. And so this bagasse has a really high BTU value. So from that, we can make um, pellets for heating. We can use it as an energy source for our, for our processing facility that, that we we're planning on, or it could be made into just some other fuel source because of you know some fuel application. So next slide. Um, this just shows like how we grow it. We start out direct seeding it. We allow it to mature for two years. Uh, that rubber is full, fully mature by, by that time. And then we can harvest it and then allow it to regenerate itself. So no reseeding is necessary. And then just do the same thing over and over again. So we know that we can we can get three harvest out of it. And now we're on our fourth cycle. So that data looks good. And we 
so we know we can get four cycles out of it. And maybe we're even going to be able to get 10 cycles out of it. So this plant is going to be in the ground for a long period of time, maybe up to 10 years with no reseeding. And this allows those roots to just be sequestering more carbon uh, because there would be a no-till practice. Um, and then the picture up on the top left side, that's it growing in a native location in the Chihuahuan Desert, same kind of plants that we see here in the Sonoran Desert with uh, creosote or ocotillo or sage. Uh, Waiuli is just native in those kind of areas. So it has all these desert characteristics, why we call it a climate appropriate crop. Um, it's got the gray leaf colors, the dense trichomes, the waxy cuticle layer, and very deep root system, taproot, that allows it to extract water and just be more drought tolerant than any other kind of crop that we grow here in Arizona. So next slide. Here's what our plans are for the future. So we're scaling up right now in 2023. We have about 250 acres that we're putting in besides the already 500 acres that we have with our farm and a couple other growers. 2024, we hope to scale up to two, add another 2,000 acres. Um, and that'll be the where we actually start building the processing plant, the first commercial facility that we hope is going to open around 2027. And for that, uh, we'll open up the one, the first of four lines. And then the remaining three lines would be opened up later on. So, and then in, in 2025, we'll need another 8,000 acres. So that would be a total of 10,000 acres that would feed this first commercial facility that would open in 2027. And then the next 10,000 acres that we plant, 2026, would feed the facility in 2028. So since it takes two years to mature, we need to have both, uh, we need to have double the amount that the plant uses. And then further, um, as, as we open up the next three lines of the facility, we're going to need 100,000 acres uh, in close proximity to this facility. So the, the idea is that we would have a number of these facilities spread out across the Southwest and other parts of the world where they have similar climates be able to grow Waiuli. So next slide. So this was Bridgestone's way of starting to introduce Waiuli to the world. We had a, um, in our headquarters are in Nashville, and they have the Music City Indian car race there in August of 2022 in, in Nashville. And so Firestone had all the tires that of all the race cars in that race uh, that, that have contain Waiuli in, in the building of the tire. That's how they introduced it. So we're looking forward to a lot more of these motorsports introduction of Waiuli coming up. So I think that's it. Thanks, David. So now um, what's next for us? Well, um, as a team, we're continuing to work together and we've just received a Climate Smart Commodity Grant um, the title is Building a Climate Smart Domestic Rubber Industry and a Solution for Growers to a Water Crisis. I just wanted to call it Climate Smart Waiuli, but this was Dave's title <laughs> that we stuck with. And it is uh, certainly very descriptive of what we're doing. Yeah. It's a true partnership between the University of Arizona and Bridgestone as we continue to work together. The USDA uh, is giving us $35 million to make a uh, bioeconomy based on Waiuli here in the Southwest and Bridgestone is matching with another 35 million. Um, we're continuing to work with Colorado State who does the techno-economic and life cycle assessment. Um, we have some interest from, it's Bonneville, right, David? Bonneville Environmental Fund um, yeah. that is helping us with some irrigation systems. Open ET is a, is a 
group that looks at like water usage and things with satellites. And we're involving numerous growers and tribal nations. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what this new grant is. We're thinking it's gonna get signed today and we can start tomorrow because we are really ready to go um, and start planting those. Some of the funds is to get that 10,000 acres into the ground. So we want to get started right away. We're really looking at optimal agricultural practices for climate smart natural rubber. We're gonna quantify greenhouse gases and how much of those are produced in the field and compare the Waiuli to existing crop rotations. Um, we'll look at soil health, water utilization, other ecological benefits of Waiuli like pollinators and um, lower uses in pesticides and herbicides. And you know, it's all towards building this climate smart natural rubber bioeconomy here in Southern Arizona and um, we're hoping to do that. And then as we work through, like what Dave said, you know, opening up, they're opening the facility and so forth. The funding is mostly for the growers. Um, we'll be participating in some USDA partnerships for climate smart commodities networks. So what we do is shared with the rest of the country and other people that have gotten this, this type of funding. And with that, we'll turn to questions. Fantastic. Um, and to Kim and David, congratulations on the USDA grant. That's the largest grant in this college's history. And David, I, I also <laughs> want to say thank you to Bridgestone because that's that's our largest industry collaborative match in this college's history. So you're making history and you're doing it for some amazingly impactful reasons. So it's wonderful to feed this into this conversation today. Um, so as I always do, many of you kindly pre-submitted questions, which we've pulled in advance, and some of you are submitting in real time, which I will continue to pull through this conversation. So I'm going to start with you, Kim, and, and, and go to a submitted question, a little bigger picture uh, about water. You know, the thing about water, as we know, is it's not evenly distributed, and uh, even beyond arid lands, you know, sometimes water is 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 not seasonally abundant sometimes it's 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 dry and wet seats and so you know how do you encourage water conservation in areas that may have at times abundant water um i think through this climate smart commodities program that the usda is putting together this is like a billion dollar program that they're funding people all over the u.s and one of the things in there is anybody that has to irrigate at all has to follow the correct practices to be able to say that they're being part of this. So like we have to get the irrigation systems have to be certified that they're doing it the right way. Or if you're flooding, your trenches have to be the right depth. So I think that there's a big national emphasis on making sure that people are doing things that are better for our climate in agriculture. And USDA is pushing a lot of this and putting money behind it. So I think that's sometimes that helps. That's very exciting. <laughs> Encouraging and, things. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're talking about arid land today. So we'll come back to that theme of water. Um, David, I, I want to go to you and talk about the Waiuli project. It's super exciting. And, you know, again, we talk a lot about scale. You you In both of your opening remarks, you talked about where this can go as scaling up. Um, you know, what changes are going to be needed in Arizona's farming and ranching ecosystem to end up being a reliable, sustainable source of Waiuli for Arizonans. And then um, beyond that, I, I want to again pull from the audience, taking your expertise as a plant specialist to talk a little bit about sustainable water practices beyond Waiuli, but for food production, in particular in the context we hear a lot about ag water and water shortages and, and the cap water. So I, I'm kind of rolling a lot into that question, David, but you've got a lot of expertise to share with us. Yeah, thanks, David. I Maybe I'll start with the obvious of with our water shortages, <laughs> crops that are grown here are going to have to use less water. And so we're going to have to get used to the idea that we may not be able to at, at least starting out, produce the yields that we've been used to in the past on some of these other crops. You know, maybe, uh, you know, whatever the crop is, uh, if you use less water until we're able to have more advances with plant breathing or our engineering systems to deliver 
water or our tech, technological advances on fertilizer, you know, that's going to be the reality. But I think the great thing about Waiuli is that it is this very tough desert plant that uses a lot less water than these other crops. In fact, that, you know, we can give it more water and maybe it'll put on more biomass, but rubber yields likely to be lower. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it is a very adaptive uh, kind of crop to this particular climate. And the, but I would say that the, you know, the, the challenge that we have is bringing the new crop into the region. You know, it, it's difficult. I mean, growers and farmers have been, you know, faced with this for many years of, hey, let's try this crop. This looks like a really great crop. And then they try it and it doesn't work out. And they've been, you know, all these promises have been made to them by investment companies or what whoever else it's been that have brought a new crop to the region. But, and then they, they try it and, you know, then all of a sudden that company has gone bankrupt and, and mm -hmm. it's no more. So I think, you know, like with the past endeavors of, with Waiuli, that certainly has happened. And I think having a company like Bridgestone that has the, you know, they, they, they have the invest, you know, the the money to back it up to get, I mean, re the reality of it, it takes, you know, somewhere in the hundreds of millions of dollars to start an industry like this. And, you know, an investment company like previous ones, they, they can't do that. Um, in the same way, the government hasn't been able to, to do it. So I, I, I'm so excited because I've worked with Waiuli all the way back to grad school and be able to see this, this crop actually, you know, be able, you know, be in this situation where it's about to be, be commercial. You, that's great. You just, you just, pushed a little at a question I was going to follow up, you know, does the fact that the University of Arizona and a company of of, Nash, of, of global international standing like Bridgestone, when you go to the farmers and say, you know, we're, we're in this to, to succeed, does that help change that narrative of people wanting to sign up? Well, I mean, it's taken time. Uh, and, you know, right away, they'll bring, oh, we tried that. We, we planted, you know, a number of acres and then the previous company walked away from it and left us holding the bag. But I think what they, you know, what we've tried to do over the past 10 years was develop partnerships with growers and allow them to see that we pay our bills. That we, I mean, not only do we pay our bills, but we've been paying up front to, so to give them the assurance that they're not going to be, you know, the same thing's not going to happen over again. So I think a lot of, you know, if you ask anybody that's grown for us, anybody that's been associated with us, they'll they'll tell you that they they have that confidence now. That's great, David. And I understand with this large, you know, combination of Bridgestone and, and USDA $70 million project, a lot of those funds do grow to paying farmers to to get invested in this. So that's wonderful. Yeah, Mom, again, water has generated a lot of, of questions and attentions, and uh, you have a lot of water expertise in, in your department. Can you comment on some of the water-related research going on, maybe beyond the Waiuli project, and maybe a word about the West Center, and then uh, comment a little bit on some other ask other units beyond Kimmy that are helping in, in this project and, and water-related areas? So yeah, the, as uh, you as David as you mentioned, we do a lot of work on water and wastewater treatment and water reuse. Um, and in particular, at the West Center, that is a pilot facility that we have that we share with the county. Um, and it is on the uh, it's you'll see it off of I ten if you ever look in Ruthroff. That's where that is, and it's actually allows us to do direct potable reuse type of work where we take um, and we use like water from the wastewater treatment plant. So it's really cool because it's co-located 
and we're able to do larger scale research. And there's four or five of my colleagues that work there at least. Um, and that's a partnership also with some people from environmental science. Um, for this particular project, uh, we're really working with the extension. And so as Dave had mentioned, um, sorry, someone's vacuuming outside. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that, but anyways, um, as Dave mentioned, there's uh, we have to work a lot with the growers. So we have many people from the extension office and uh, that are part of the extension in, in Maricopa. So um, part of the goal of this project will be to have those people like a soil specialist and an insect specialist and a herbicide specialist, they'll be growing Waiuli um, little parcels right on growers' lands to show them all the best practices and, and show, we'll be like demonstrating things in five different plots across the region during this research project so people can really see what's going on. Um, and then, uh, so those are the major players, but there are also people in atmospheric sciences um, that are working on this project uh, because we have to measure the greenhouse gases and things like that as well. And Kim, I'm sticking with just for one quick question from the audience. Somebody asked, or maybe either one of you, someone asked, can the bagas be converted into an alcohol, say for a liquid fuel feedstock? Is that a possible path for some of the other Waiuli byproducts? So we, um, as we finish up the SBAR project, one of the last things that we're doing is we've done a um, taking bagas through fast pyrolysis to a um, low grade fuel and then an upgrading um, to jet and diesel. So that wow. data, the, the first part's been done and then the upgrading is um, in process. It's one of the last things that we're doing to demonstrate that this can actually happen um, as part of the SBAR project. The technology for that, for dry gas is pretty well known um, in the field, but we just wanted to do some to say like we did and here's the fuel, but we were looking at jet and diesel, not ethanol. Good. Excellent. Um, David, kind of sticking with our theme of air lands and your expertise around plant science, what other sustainable resources might be out there that are underutilized? And uh, you know, what steps could our future engineers and scientists do to utilize those or shift the perspectives about utilizing those? Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> there's, um, I think, in the way of precision agriculture, uh, there's there's a lot more that we can do to get you know what we all these inputs that the crop needs uh placed in a in a you know more precise way in the same way with monitoring these inputs with with drone technology and things like that uh that's certainly an area the other big area is probably with water distribution uh there's been some newer technology with um, non-conventional drip that uses gravity flow uh, to get the water there. Drip systems, as Kim knows, and we, we've had experience with, of, are really, really expensive. I mean, uh, to, to, you know, the amount of, of resources that takes, it's great, it saves water, but it, they, it, it is expensive. Um, so th this newer technology is good, but I think there still needs to be a lot of work on can, can we have this system in the ground for a number of years? Like what about 10 years? Um, how is it going to hold up there? So I think that that's a that's something that really needs to be work, worked on. And then of course, you know, everything else that we do in agriculture can always be improved and, and geared for this climate friendly kind of environment that we want to have. Excellent. Kim, how do you address, you know, sustainable air and sustainable opportunities from the perspective of our educational and our research missions? I, I think what it, it does is it allows us to give um, real world examples in our classes and the things that we do. And I think it attracts more students to work with us because we're working on things that they understand that they're interested in. And it, it um, brings more diversity to our uh, college and majors because it's something that's like, this is what I deal with every day. So let's, you know, this is the world around me. So we try to really integrate 
the research that we're doing right into classroom examples and so forth. Very nice. Um, David, you've nicely framed the Waiuli project in the context of a need to find sustainable domestic rubber sources. And, and you know, you did that very nicely. Um, you talked about the sole source dependence we have now on natural rubber in a very geographically isolated, isolated area with changing labor markets. Can you also speak about the motivation from Bridgestone's perspective of addressing climate sustainability as, as corporations such as, as Bridgestone look increasingly to ESG aspects? And then as, a, as an aside, um, have people looked into ways to reduce labor in harvesting of natural rubber through mechanation or something? So a couple of things in there to talk beyond the original motivation. Sure. Um, Bridgestone has really uh, made sustainability, like many companies, um, a major part of our business. I mean, not, not just by saying the word, but really implementing it into all our business and starting a whole section on life cycle anal analysis on all our products and tires that we put on the road. They all, they all now have this um, very critical look on on what it's doing to the environment. So I, I mean, it's been really gratifying for me to see this turn in, in business emphasis over the past several years. And then Waiuli has just really fed, fit into um, what, what Bridgestone is trying to convey to the public um, by having this sustainable plant um, that, you know, that, uh, just everything about it is, is sustainable. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess is, I, I'm not sure what, what else were you asking? Oh, I, the other question, just to the, to the, to the human labor needs for natural rubber, uh, you know, the, the going out and oh, yeah, yeah. shopping, have people yeah. tried to use machines to make that, yeah. what maybe you could say more sustainable from, from the human labor market? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the plant, I, I don't know that anything has really been done in that way. The plant doesn't really lend itself to mechanized harvest because the to get the latex out, it has to be tapped, um, you know, just like log cabin syrup uh, that we get back east. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not mechanized either. And so it it really doesn't lend itself to that. I mean, other attempts like to monitor yields and um, logistics about the harvest, things like that have been mechanized, but as far as going out and collecting the latex, um, so far that hasn't been done. Good. Um, you mentioned in your opening talk, I'll stay with you for a second, David. In your opening talk, you talked about you know, we've had some past history with Waiuli. Have there been other sort of big experiments, you know, in the last 50, 60 years of trying to find other domestic sources of rubber that that maybe have you've learned from and or that haven't worked very well? And on top of that, of pulling from the audience, are there any issues with, you know, putting what we think of as a non-native plant in this area in the ground? So kind of two, two questions there that I think, again, rely on your experience. Yeah, those are good questions too. And for for one thing, there's hundreds of plants, plant species that make natural rubber, but there's only really a few plants that we know of that make this high quality rubber that's that we can use for these kinds of uses, like tires or um, <clears throat> the other products that that we would make from the latex. And so Waiuli is one of them certainly. And then back in the, back during World War II, uh, there was a big effort called the Emergency Rubber Project where our rubber supply got cut off because of the war. And so we yeah. started really looking hard to see if there's some way that we can uh, produce our own rubber. And so they, they had this scientific team they put together it was a huge product project that where they started looking for other sources and 
uh, found all kinds of candidates for it, but the only ones that really came up were uh, the Russian dandelion, um, which we call TKS, and that can be grown back in the Midwest, more of a temperate kind of climate. It's not, not as far along in development as Waiuli is, but still has good quality rubber. And we hope that that's gonna progress. And then there's some flowers that could be genetically engineered because they grow all over the place. It makes a small amount of natural rubber, but not enough to make it you know, commercially viable. But so other plants do produce natural rubber, but um, only a few are, are really candidates for, for the future. Very interesting. And I suspected back in, in the World War II era, there would have been motivations to explore domestic sources. So that's interesting to know that yeah. little bit of history. But um, there was there was another time back in the 1970s that I showed on that slide where when we had the oil embargo, usually oil and rubber prices, they're commodity traded and they go hand in hand on prices. And so when that shortage was, the oil embargo was taken off, taken place back in the 70s. That's when there was this another, other like fluctuation in, in looking at, at Waiuli. It's very interesting. Kim, as you know, our alumni like to get into engineering details. So why don't you speak a little bit to the irrigation and water usage of the Waiuli? You know, how does that compare to other crops? I know we talk about the five C's in Arizona, cotton is one of them. So you know, why don't you ground us in, in what does water usage look like and how might that compare to something that we're all a little more familiar with like cotton? So um, the great thing about Waiuli and why we're so excited about this too is it takes about half the water of cotton or about two and a half acre feet. Um, that's how we measure that for those of you in the engine in the, the water world or whatever. Um, so that's what's so exciting about it. The other thing that um, Dave didn't mention about Wiley that's great is if for some reason there's like no water that comes down the pipe, which could happen right. um, at some point or whatever for a little while, it, it can just like stay. Um, you know, it's not going to die and then it can start to grow again and stuff when it's given water again. So that's another huge advantage of life. That was one of our alums just asked that question. If the sort of cap shuts down for a period of time, can you survive? <laughs> and the answer is yes. And staying on the details, talk a little bit about, I know part of your project is to ultimately understand the life cycles and the techno-economic analysis. What is that looking like, you know, now? How, do, how does it shape up? Is this sort of cost effective ultimately in your modeling? So on the techno-economic, um, some of the first things that we did is we were looking at like what would be a rubber price. Um, and our techno, I should back up just a little. Our modeling is from like farm all the way through production. So we look at the agriculture part as well as the processing facility and so forth. So when we started the project, we did things where it was like, well, what is the um, rubber price that we need if we just assume what we could get for bagasse and what we could get for resin. So we picked a bucket kilogram for um, bagasse, no, for resin, sorry, and like 10 cents for the, the bagasse because it's just dry wood or whatever. And we ended up with a rubber selling place of around $3 a kilogram, which is in the cycle of rubber, but it it goes, Dave probably knows more. I mean, it goes from one to $10 or whatever it does. I mean, it's it can go all over the place. Yeah. Um, so that was some of the first modeling. And now that's why we're really focusing on things like the resin and what, you know, what could it be sold for right. um, that would get us one or two dollars a, a kilogram, that kind of thing. And I'll pick up Tom Peterson's question that I saw in the chat. Sorry. Um, that is there a lot of polymer science and so forth. And with that resin, there definitely is for the rubber type part, of course you know, Bridgestone owns the IP for that, right? And, and those types of things. So we've been focusing together more on the resin and looking at different polymer chemistries and transformations of the resin to make things like adhesive. And we have um, a couple patents under review, and then we're looking at some joint patents between Bridgestone and U of A for some of this adhesive stuff. And so that's pretty cool. Um, so that's some of the polymer chemistry that we're doing. On the life cycle side, um, right now, the processing is, you know, is the agriculture isn't, um, doesn't 
um, make a lot of the, the greenhouse gases and things. And, you know, we're going to prove that for sure in this next um, study. And more of the life cycle issue is more on the chemical processing of um, the rubber. But um, all uh, the, the Bridgestone processes, they recycle and reuse all their solvents and things. So it's always in the forefront of their minds to make sure that we have, uh, that they're doing good processing and so forth with a lot of recycle and reuse. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, David, back to you. You know, we talked about Bridgestone is putting up for this particular project $35 million in cost sharing. Can you kind of talk about just the general scope of Bridgestone's investment in things like sustainable you know, renewable rubber, put some context around that. And then we're on this theme of numbers. Engineers like units. This is probably one of my favorite units I've ever seen. Tires per acre per harvest. That's a new one for me. I don't know if that's metric or English, but uh, we'll, we'll let you interpret what that looks like. Yeah. Well, yeah, Bridgestone has a lot of other projects um, focused around like end of life tires. Uh, how do we you know, work that into a circular economy. And so partnering with other other companies that that can help with that kind of project, uh, Waiuli will be partly connected and I won't say much about that, but they'll, the, that, that could be part of this um, biorefinery kind of concept that, that we've talked about with SBAR and um, sustainability. So yeah, they, I mean, they, they have a number of projects like that. Um, as far as the yield, um, we you're not used to hearing tires per acre, but uh, <laughs> that, that's ultimately what we're after. And it, it really depends on the, the kind of tire that you're talking about to really focus in on on that kind of metric. But, you know, if we were talking about a small truck tire, maybe it would be like 60, I think we calculated 68 tires per acre would be a, a normal uh, a normal yield. Yeah, so when you talk about 10,000 or 100,000 acres, then you really could impact millions of tires. Yeah which is very significant. Yeah. Excellent. Kim, over the years, you've had some really exciting and, and I think impactful projects that interact with the indigenous tribes of Arizona. Can you speak to the tribe's potential involvement with this project and how that potential economic benefits could help the tribes of Arizona? Yeah, sure. There, there's two. The first is as part of this, when we sign up um, different growers, that our goal is also to have uh, tribes use their native lands and um, to grow the Waiuli. Um, it is a process uh, and we have to get resolutions or MOAs, um, depending on the tribe, uh, to be able to do this. So Dave and um, our friends in Extension have worked really closely with a lot of the native growers. And then we've given a lot of presentations. They have like a Southwest Indian agriculture association meeting that I've gone to three or four times or whatever, just to, you know, continue to communicate with the growers, um, the, the tribal growers. So our first ones are going to be the CRIT, which is um, the Colorado River Indian tribes. Um, and then we're working with other partners as well to get these um, kind of MOUs or resolutions in place. And it just it, it just takes a lot of time and it, we have to continue to build the trust. So they will actually be, you know, receiving funds um, to grow Waiuli and then they'll have a market for, you know, their Waiuli forever. Um, and then uh, the other thing is on the educational side. So we work with a lot of the tribal colleges here and um, that would be for the workforce, right? So if we're, we're trying to work with some tribal colleges to get more students to be able to transfer um, to the U of A, to obtain degrees that are not offered at the tribal colleges that would feed this bioeconomy. Um, and so we're working with um, Tohono O'odham, San Carlos Apache, and uh, Diné on those types of things to, you know, again, have the right workforce that, you know, we need a workforce to grow the plants and to uh, run the facilities. It's exciting. Um, so some wonderful collaborations 
with the indigenous tribes of Arizona and, and even surrounding areas. Um, just stepping back a little more around collaborative research, which you've done very well, as you both framed in your opening slides, this, this project has a lot of partners. Um, you know, Kim, give us, you know, and we see that more from, from federal sponsors these days is they want to put a lot more money at a lot bigger projects, which means coalitions and collaborations. You want to just speak a little bit to, to those efforts, Kim? Uh, I, I know they can be exhausting, but they can also be very fruitful. You want to give us some of your you know, experiences and how do you make these work? Um, I think th the key is to find the right team and to have, be very transparent and forward with everybody that's on your team. Um, I, I think between U of A and Bridgestone, we have a great relationship that's really built on trust. Um, I talk to Dave a lot and then his counterpart that runs the processing um, pilot plant or whatever, you're, you're both in my cell phone and we chat quite a bit about different things so that that trust is always continuously built. I think managing, you know, the, the big collaborations, you just, you just have to continue to be, you know, really communicative. And sometimes you have to like, let some of your own stuff go. If this, I don't know if you want to hear this, David, but like for the first year of the SBAR or whatever, like I didn't take a graduate student or postdoc or anything because I really needed to get everything going and to do both at the same time would have been very challenging. So I waited until the second year to then get my own postdoc and to, you know, do some things or whatever, because it, it's just a lot. So it's a lot to get the things off the ground. With this next one, the convenient thing is the team already knows each other. Like we already understand each other. And, you know, it, it's not it's not a continuation grant. It's a new grant, a new effort um, on the same topic. But, you know, we already know each other so we can all get going at the same time. Right. David, from your perspective, you know, companies, again, do things at scale. How has it been working with universities? And, you know, have there been uh, any any issues getting to learn how we work together from, from Bridgetown? You've been a great partner. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's been a new kind of experience for Bridgestone. I mean, Bridgestone, they're Japanese owned and they have a certain way of doing things and, you know, keeping company secrets and things like that. And I understand that. I mean, I came from working for my most of my career with USDA. And so coming to a private company, like it was, uh, oh my gosh, this is you know, I can't say this or I can't say that. And then this opportunity for SBAR came along and um, it was like all of a sudden Bridgestone started seeing the benefits of being more collaborative and sharing like our products and having people come to our research farm or come into our, you know, facility and seeing what we're doing and not being so secretive about it. And I think the company really did a switch and, and now being just more open to things like this. And they, they're they really excited about this Climate Smart grant and being able to not only like get things off the ground, but be able to change what we're doing with growers and having them grow things in a more sustainable way than than what's done now in traditional agriculture. So it's That's really great. been a, a great thing. That's great. You guys are sort of pioneering the way. Um, I'm going to pull from the audience real quick. David, as, as our plant science expert, someone asks, and I know one of our own alumnus from this, this college has done work with the jojoba bean. Uh, how does that plant you know, compare to this type of a bio project, if you know anything about the jojoba bean, and, and it's, I think, an oil producing plant? Any experience there? Um, yeah, I've had experience working with Hohoba and working with U of A on on the project. But the the difference between a crop like Waiuli and a crop like Hohoba is that the market size. Waiuli has this tremendous global market, and when you're talking about oil seeds, uh, I know Hohoba is more specific kind of oil that that has maybe more applications but it it really doesn't have the the broad market that Waiuli does and so I think you know it got off the ground and it also started out like in a not a good way where it got 
the the market got ahead of the research. And so you really, you know, when you're working on a new crop, you really got to get things in order. You have to make sure that you can do what you're going to say it does. And you can't just like go out. Hemp's doing the same thing. I mean, they're they're going out before they know a lot about um, how how the a lot about the crop. So very good. Yeah. Let the let the science lead. I'm yeah. going to pull a, a question from the audience, which is a, a a wonderful question. We see these videos sometimes of mountains of tires, used tires. So what is the what are the economics or the technical problems of recycling or reusing? rubber and tires. Um, I'll ask both of you to comment on David Bridgestone must know a thing about that. What what are some of the <laughs> why can't we do that? I guess it's a simple question that, that I'll let Kim from a Kim perspective see if she's looked into that. Yeah, maybe Kim go first. I I'm a plant person. So, <laughs> but I will I'll put my opinion in but I I, uh, I mean I think a lot of people have tried it. Like the founder of our department um tried to do some recycling of tires and rubber projects, actually he had this old extruder and different things downstairs and he was looking at some of that. Um, it, it's like anything, I think it, it probably can be done, but it's just so uncost effective, you know, to do these things, but it is not my area of expertise. But I, when I've talked to um, other people at Bridgestone more in the processing, it, it is an area that they continue to look into as well because of this whole sustainability. Is that fair, David? That's what I thought Bob had told me well, but it's well yeah like you said it's really difficult to when once you break down the tire to be able to recycle it and put it in to a new tire and so I don't know that that's um work that that we're trying to do but it, it's more our our work is more like looking at enzymatic processes that can break a tire down and and put it to other uses um, besides, you know, putting it back, making or, another time. Or asphalt, or don't they put some, chop some of it up for asphalt or whatever? Yeah, asphalt in, in Florida, I've seen yeah. them work on artificial reefs. So there's yeah. there's different ideas that they can do. Good, that's a good question. Kim, um, let's talk about workforce because we talk a lot about STEM workforce and engineers to drive the economy. How do projects like this help train, you know, our young engineers? Um, I, I think what it does for the engineers, it gives you know more research experiences for them in the labs and things that we're doing. Um, we've done internships as part of the um, SBAR project and um, Project Puente, where we've actually put high school students and community college students um, in our labs at Bridgestone has taken quite a few in um, learning things. So I, I think the biggest part for the workforce is like interesting more people in STEM, which is the big problem, and then giving them, you know, more options and more things that they can see and how they too can be part of the whole STEM workforce with things that they, you know, from agriculture to engineering um, all the way through the pipeline. And how do you see our young students responding to the sustainability aspects of a project like this? I, I see that in our students a lot, that they're very interested, not just in good engineering and science, but in, in sort of making that impact. Do you see that as well in your chemi and environmental students? Absolutely. So um, well, I'll go a little broader. So I do a lot with my professional society, um, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. And at AICHE, we ask the students, whether there's like student members and stuff, what they're interested in if they have an area within chemical engineering that they're interested in. And one of them is sustainability in the environment and the Institute for Sustainability within AICHE. And almost, you know, 50% of the students that put, you know, check the box, check that box um, is what they're interested in. And yeah, that's excellent. I hope that this stimulates lots of engineers to come in and we can feed some of those to you, David. So to help uh, turn this into a commercially viable product. That does bring us to the top of the hour. Um, I just want to thank both of you for having this conversation. It's really important. Um, it, it's important to the economy. It's important to the sustainability of what we do. And so I'm grateful for you sharing with our alumni and friends out there the exciting project. And congratulations on, on a huge effort to uh, bring that project home and Bridgestone for supporting it in such a significant way, both intellectually and financially. So I want to say thank, thank you. you to you both. And I put one plug in. Yes, please, David. If there's any uh, students on the call, 
we're looking for student interns um, at our Eloy farm and also looking for a lab technician. So outstanding. Okay. Just okay. reach out to Kim Ogden and uh, <laughs> she can bring you into this project. And I, I really appreciate you bringing it to that point, David, because we're all about getting our students into the real world to yeah. do what we call hands-on experiential yeah. learning. Um, this does conclude our, our webinars for the spring semester. It's been really good topics and very contemporary topics. So thanks to our audience and our friends for staying with us. Again, thank yeah. you, David. Thank you, Kim. And thanks for our team, Brian and Ines and David, Margie, for helping put this together. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm.